Hello everybody. A uh, very warm welcome on this webinar which will talk about few hints about building a recommendation engine which happens to be a movie recommendation engine using the help of Spark. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for confirming guys. I just wanted to quickly check. And yes, I can, seems like I know already few people from this webinar with whom we have interacted some time. Good morning, Parling. Good morning. So, <laughs> well, so the guys with whom we have already interacted. Okay, so, yep, sharp 9.30. I just, I was just quickly checking uh, whether things are in place. I hope everybody is able to see the screen properly. Am I right, guys? the screen which talks about developing a movie recommendation engine with Spark. Great. Thanks a lot. So, okay, uh, very quickly, let's just get started. Welcome, guys, uh, to this webinar. Uh, before we get started about the things which we plan to cover in the incoming one hour, let me just quickly introduce myself and then of course I would definitely like to know a bit more about you also right uh, my name is Vishal and uh, I carry almost more than now more than 12 years of experience overall um, I'm working in this big data domain so-called big data domain because when we started there was just a set of disruptive technologies altogether uh, since last almost five years now. Like most of you, my journey started in Hadoop and then eventually had to graduate uh, towards the different systems. Now I'm primarily working into the domain of so-called Lambda architecture wherein you just try to you know, integrate these uh, batch analytic systems plus real-time or near real-time analytic systems along with the you know, uh, legacy systems themselves. Uh, typically, that's an area which is called lambda architecture. Um, and when it comes to the different domains, it's uh, primarily into the domain of finance, banking, retail, quite a few projects about healthcare domain, uh, some other domains as well, but well, they are quite negligible as compared to this. Oh, well, I think that should be good enough as an introduction, um, you know, seeing that it's just one hour duration uh, which we have together, right? Well, more than that, I would definitely be more interested in seeing or knowing some of you if it would be great if you could just type quickly about, let's say, I of course know your name, probably a bit of your overall experience, the background with which you are coming. And let's say, what exactly do you think is going to be your expectation from this webinar? So let's let's just spend a couple of more minutes on that. And of course, I am looking at the questions tab, wherein you can just type about your experiences. Great. I can see. And yes, please, uh, you know, uh, just as collaborate with me because I there are a lot of people who'd be typing in so I'll be taking some of the latest ones you know which are pouring in so yes as I can see that uh, some of the latest ones guys some of the latest ones which are pouring in it's uh, from Don okay Don Tremel uh, seems like he's having uh, yep he's having more than 12 years of experience and is working in big data so welcome Don you are almost we are I think we share quite a lot of background in terms of number of years of experience. He's, I think, currently working in Gap, Gap Inc. and working in the big data domain since last almost two years. Great to know. Before that, he comes from the background of Core Java developer. Nice. Good to know. There is Natalia, who is, who is having, I think, more than eight years of experience and she primarily comes from the background of data warehousing. And I think, yeah, uh, and she's working for Walmart Labs, great. In terms of expectations, it's primarily to know how exactly you plan to use Spark for something like, you know, recommendation engine. 
great i think yes that that's primary primarily uh, the topic for this webinar as well and we'll we'll, we'll just see different parts of it as in when we'll progress there uh, there are guys uh, i think I'll, I'll take one more uh, example here uh, so there is uh, akriti agrawal who is having uh, almost two years of experience and uh, quite new altogether as compared to some of the other experience levels which we just talked. So of course this this shows that yes it's it's quite a healthy mix of people from different backgrounds of uh, you know ex and the experience levels as well. Well guys all I can assure you is I'll try my level best to you know address all of uh, you know your or most of your expectations in terms of the objectives or well with that let's just quickly come to the topics which or the objectives which we had in mind when we were discussing or when we were designing this webinar so at the end of this webinar right uh, of course when you talk about a recommendation engine probably that itself is a deep theory in itself but at a high level what exactly a recommendation engine is you should definitely have an idea about it major companies which are using recommendation engines definitely it's not just that there should be a slide which says hey so and so companies are using recommendation engines probably let's see some of those examples in action or we might already be seeing some of those examples in action but let's call them out right so that's a that's the second objective which we have in mind. The third, coming to the crux of the matter, um, when you talk about the recommendation engine, what are the different approaches which are taken and which approach is the one which is more common, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that and eventually uh, we'll talk about what really happens or how exactly you can use Spark and there is a component called machine learning library right so mllib so how do you use spark and machine learning library along with to generate a recommendation engine and you know uh, if some of you have attended you know uh, the courses earlier or some webinars earlier we typically don't do anything without hands on so my idea would be that even this in one hour session let's spend almost kind of let's say around 30 minutes 40 minutes of time for the theory part of it and then another 15 minutes 20 minute sort of time for a bit of hands on right uh, wherein of course in a in a one go or since the language the uh, concepts might be new so idea would be to see the things in action or to you know quickly put the things into action whatever we have just learned right and then see something working right though as I told recommendation engine themselves could be a different you know course in itself right so those are the broader objectives I hope guys this looks like a good investment of one hour of your precious time Am I right in assuming so guys? Can I proceed ahead with that? And yes, one more thing which is kind of a question or common question that uh, will the PPT be available? Will uh, this recording be available to me? So guys, oh, the recordings of this webinar, the PPTs of these webinars will be mailed to you, uh, to your registered email IDs so don't worry about those aspects okay with that guys let's have fun let's get started quickly okay so I just want you to have a look of the slide rather than me first talking about it after all it's just a quote spend few seconds this pause is purposeful so <laughs> there are no no issues in the line we are right now moving in the direction of discovery 
earlier or there is quite a good amount of era, quite a good amount of time which we have invested or we have lived through the time of search. Search is typically when you know what you are looking for and then you try to find out where exactly I do find you know details about it right that's what you do in the Google search typically right well you are no more living in just the era of Google search you're going in the direction of smart Google or you know some of the things which know you and eventually they tell you which you don't know firsthand and that that's a difference between search and discovery in fact that's one of the biggest mantra also for most of the machine learning enthusiasts when people say what do you expect right so the stakeholders typically say well tell me something which I don't know discover something for me you know if you come back after all of your analysis and then you come back and say hey you know if you do uh, you know X Y Z things right in your inventory side your profits would be increased by X amount of percentage this is something which probably is not unknown to the business users they already know about it but you know so you are not going in the direction of search you are going in the direction of discovery so what does it mean in terms of the discovery right it is easy to say let's see with some examples right so the difference typical difference between a search and a discovery so moving on to the next slide which which we feel or which is quite personal it's, I'm sure most of you would have seen these things in your life at one point or the other right so some days back when I was uh, visiting Amazon I just searched for Kindle and then close the session and eventually next day when I logged in back with my email ID of course it is started showing me that apart from just the Kindle you might be interested in or the related items you know which you have viewed I'm sure all of you have seen that right that's a perfect example of discovery I knew that I'm searching for Kindle but what I found is there is an adapter there is a case which comes okay which is like again which is specific to the different models then there are some better options right in terms of I iPad or, or any any kind of tablet and all that's the example of discovery right when I was doing the search I was pretty much sure that I'm looking forward for something like you know Kindle but I was not at all sure whether you know I I would probably be interested in let's say an iPad or, or something like that right wherein probably and they have the effect wherein you can actually change your mind to go for something higher or probably you might even end up buying some you know more than one thing typically in the behavioral economics we call it as impulsive shopping right so they these are the things which it trigger these kind of behaviors altogether that's the first example of discovery right so effectively you're talking about recommendations and this is just one example right this is just one example We'll, we'll be coming to some more examples you know a uh, few minutes down the line but yeah building on the same things right broadly when it comes to the recommendations or the different approaches which people typically take to generate the recommender systems you have you have three approaches main approaches altogether one is collaborative filtering okay the second is content based content based recommendation and then the third one is typically called actually it's not it's like a hybrid method or it's a combination of previous two 
So now, just going one more level down, when you talk about or when you, when you suggest the things to people wherein, uh, so uh, you know, when, when I suggest you something which is based on the recommended items which, which you suggested to other people who had the similar tastes like you, okay? And when I go ahead and I try to suggest the same things to you, right? That is the typical example which of collaborative filtering. When you talk about your content-based filtering, that is typically the example wherein it is more personalized, right? Right now, in the first case, I said, I'm going to recommend you something which I recommended to another person who was similar in taste, who had similar taste like you, right? The second approach, which is content-based, is actually the one which is more personalized because the user gets recommended for the items which are similar to the ones which you have preferred in past, right? So, not sure, again, Amazon is my favorite example. In the recommendation section also, they have multiple sections, okay? The sections which say, the users who bought whatever you bought, let's say in past, also bought, there is a section. Then there is another section, inspired by your purchase history. Probably you can even open on the sidelines if you are in front of your system, you can actually open that. Then there is another one, there is third one, which is actually not a recommendation, but uh, you know, it's kind of an example of hybrid, which talks about trending or most sold items or currently most of the people are looking at so and so items. Amazon actually has reached to the stage wherein they kind of, you know, give you almost all kind of recommendations. Okay, so the first one which said that, you know, users who liked it or users who bought this item also bought something else. That's a perfect example of collaborative filtering. Inspired by your purchase history is the best example of content base. And then the third one, which is hybrid methods. Basically, it is that trending thing. It can be treated as the hybrid method wherein they use a lot of collaborative filtering and content based approaches. They mix and match. In fact, the most successful ones are the hybrid methods altogether. But yeah, people typically start from one of them and eventually when they mature, they go in the direction of hybrid methods altogether. Okay, so seems like we just covered a kind of, you know, let's say different kinds of recommendation approaches. Let's just check very quickly. What did we learn or did we learn something? So, and this is a question back to you guys. It's you, if you have attended our sessions earlier, they're always interactive. So guys, uh, last.fm, there are, if you have not, you, you must have visited it, those people who love music and all. So, which kind of recommendation is this? Which kind of recommendation is this? And yes, I can see that people have already started answering Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I'm just looking for some more responses, guys, okay, well, guys, there are very few right answers, wherein it is actually the perfect example of collaborative filtering, sort of, okay, this will become, of course, some of you might be thinking that it will, it should actually be the part of content-based, it will become content base as well the moment you'll start logging in using your accounts then it will be more personalized next I'm DB what kind of example do you think it is actually I'm a very big fan of the site that really helps me a lot again I think the same kind of approach goes there as well if you are logged into this website without being 
logged in i mean uh, if you just open this website without being logged in based on your probably session history your click stream data whatever you are generating right it kind of gives you it kind of guesses that what kind of you know recommendation should be generated altogether right next amazon so well what other items do customer buy after viewing this item well now i think i had already discussed that right i had already discussed that what kind of other items right so well it's a classic case of of what exactly now people are on the right page now people are on the right page where you talk about it's a perfect example of collaborative filtering right because we are not showing the example or we are not showing the case of inspired by your purchase history what about this what about this if you would have subscribed let's say to some of the edureka videos and then you see more and more recommendations so what do you think which kind of recommendation is this when you go to youtube and recommended videos mhm mm yes perfect exactly it's content based it's typically content based right so here the assumption is of course on the youtube side typically you would be going for and all subscribing so you should have the behavior of logged in and then eventually you will have those kind of personalized uh, recommendations what about this what about this so this is like very quick test of your knowledge altogether right a quick application of whatever you just learned exactly guys this is a perfect case of content based recommendation well this was like and i can see that there are lot of people who answered of course some were on the right side some were the guesses as well and that happens but i just hope guys this very quick uh, exercise would have given you good idea you know even before you start you know getting into the details of how do you actually or what exactly is the approach which you take to generate or to create a recommendation system it should have given you the idea about you know uh, what exactly are we talking about what exactly are we trying to approach now right with that let me just move to the next part which is implementation of the recommendation engine right so up to now we just talked about what are the different kinds of recommendations now i'm going to take the example in fact the hands on example would actually uh, be the collaborative filtering example but let me just say any generic recommendation engine from the perspective of you know whether whatsoever approach you are taking whether you are taking the approach of a hybrid or you are taking the approach of content based or even collaborative doesn't really matter right so in any kind of recommendation engine you do have three important parts the data source okay the data source from where you are fetching the data based on that you will start applying your machine learning algorithm second here it is written as spark okay here it is written as spark well it is not true i mean or rather than not necessarily true there might be different companies which might be using different components when we say spark spark is suggested spark is a suggested component for the processing part of your algorithm because of its low latency computing the power which spark draws is there is i mean there are few more details which Uh, you know which we cover actually in our course all together but spark does primarily the in memory processing of the data right so typically spark would be the place wherein this will be the framework which will be responsible right which will be uh, 
responsible to run your algorithm and MLLib. MLLib it's a library of machine learning algorithms which are built on the top of Spark. So it's a collection of the different libraries which are available. However, at this point of time, I would uh, I would just very quickly want to tell you that machine learning libraries or MLLib is still under active development. So it is still in the alpha, pre-alpha releases. Of course, you know, there are there is some time which is required for it to become production ready, but the developer APIs are open. And that exactly is something which I would like to, you know, quickly show you also. With that, just moving forward and going in a bit more details there. Guys, this is how a recommendation engine, okay? A typical recommendation engine looks like. You have data source. Well, you are seeing Hadoop coming into picture now. There is Hadoop, there is Spark. I think some two-way interaction is happening with a block called MLLib. And eventually you have application which is probably going to be your front end for any of the users who are, let's say, on the extreme right side. Okay looks like a kind of a process flow diagram doesn't it look like that well it is almost like that but let's start analyzing the things in bit more detail you know each and every component of it right so let's start getting into this part the first part is the data source the different sources from which you can fetch the data and as I can see already on the questions tab that there are so many people who are saying can I fetch the data from Cassandra can I fetch the data from HBase or whether can I fetch the data let's say from any other NoSQL database or even for that matter let's say in RDBMS well I think this particular slide should be giving you the idea about it that your data source could virtually be anything altogether. Your data source could be a simple, you know, CSV file, tab separated file, Excel, probably an RDBMS, a simple file system, or just a directory in SDFS, or even in any of the, you know, NoSQL databases also. So I hope there, I saw at least there are like, 10 or 15 questions which are already in this direction were what could be my data source. I hope all of you got the answer in those lines that you know it could be virtually be any of those data sources popular or known data sources from where um, Spark can consume the data. Now this is the first part wherein you are just talking about the data source. If you zoom in to the second thing which was Hadoop. Now, well, you have just told that the data can be taken from different data sources, right? But guys, you know it better than me there, I would say, that your data from the different sources is not going to have the uniform structure. Or probably if you are unlucky, unlucky enough, then it will not be structured at all, completely unstructured data, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, free formatted text or probably some video files or some audio files and all, or some semi-structured data. Somebody has just dumped the XML files or JSON files altogether, right? So that is first thing. You know, you're talking about different kinds of data which might come. And then the second thing, it's about when it comes, you're talking about the data which is coming from different sources, being accumulated at a single place, and more often than not, it's huge amount of data. Click stream, you know, somebody's just visiting your website 10 times and then there are 10,000 concurrent users and then I don't need to talk about how much data you are going to generate per hour, right? That's where it's the natural playground of Hadoop. That's where Hadoop comes 
for your rescue, isn't it? Right. So there, Hadoop acts as kind of your staging area. That's where either you have Hadoop or you have something which kind of let's say dumps the data into Hadoop. Probably it might even be um, something like Flume. It might even be Kafka and all, right? Your popular messaging, uh, distributed messaging systems and all. So they, they will come into picture here. That's a step two, wherein it's kind of your staging area altogether, right? Then comes the third part, that's Spark. So once you have all of the data which is in place, Spark comes for the processing part. Up to now, whatever you have handled is basically the storage side of it. But then when it comes to the processing side of it, well, if I just extend the same example of click stream data on your website, let's say with a moderate number of 10,000 concurrent users, right? You're talking about a huge amount of data. Processing is one part, but if you do not process it in time, that's where you have the problem. And Apache Spark, at this point of time, those people who are not aware of what exactly Spark is, it's a cluster computing system. Sounds like Hadoop. I hope, I'm sure those people who are aware of Hadoop, you must have, you must be seeing that, oh, okay, it's a cluster computing system. The key word here is in memory. It's an in memory cluster computing system. So I can see that, uh, yes, uh, Sunil has asked a question that, you know, what is it which is making Spark faster? It's basically the nature of the in-memory processing. There is a basic building block of any Spark processing, which is called RDD, Resilient Distributed Data Set. That makes the processing in Spark way faster. Okay, so you typically take you typically take the power of in-memory processing of the cluster computing system, and it gives you the capability of almost real time or actually, uh, you know, uh, almost real time sort of, you know, uh, uh, processing of the data altogether. All right. Uh, now, there is something which I think we have written. It is very much possible to have your recommendation engine. So there might be people who may say, well, you're just talking about the recommendation engine. Aren't you just talking about something like uh, your uh, uh, machine learning algorithm? What's the problem with Hadoop? I can run it in Hadoop. No problems at all. There is absolutely no problem from the schematics perspective. But the problem comes when you talk about recommendations in time, right? You definitely want to generate the recommendation when the person is still there on your website. You don't want to generate the recommendation tomorrow when you do not have the guarantee whether the person will come back or not. Am I right? It basically gives the more time per user on your website. I hope guys you are able to connect, right? And hence the performance part becomes very important. And that's where Hadoop lags. And because of the in-memory processing nature of Spark and the nature which typically your uh, uh, machine learning algorithm have, what is the typical nature of your machine learning algorithms? What is that typical nature? If anybody would help me on that. The typical nature of your machine learning algorithms is they are iterative in nature, right? They are iterative in nature or recursive in nature also depending upon what kind of processing you are doing, right? So they, they can be of any of these natures. These are not the natural playgrounds. They are not the natural playgrounds for Hadoop because you are talking about multiple passes of the same data, multi-processing of the same data. No, something which is definitely not for Hadoop. And hence, Spark plays a big role there. Comes MLlib next. So MLlib. When it comes to MLlib part, MLlib is something wherein it's a machine learning library. So for example, guys, 
in fact you will see the example which I'll use today uh, of course time would not allow me to tell you the entire algorithm of machine learning which I'm doing because ultimately I will be invoking the library there this is called uh, alternative least square method that's one of the most common methods of collaborative filtering and the point is the moment I said alternating least squares method I'm sure or correct me if I'm wrong my assumption is more than half of you either would not have worked on it or probably might not even have heard about it right so when it comes to the implementation either you implement it by yourself or MLlib comes for your rescue wherein these are the very common algorithms which are used across industry and they are generic algorithms they are not like well this kind of algorithm can be used only and only in retail this kind of algorithm can be used only and only in banking and so on and so forth they are generic algorithms which can be parameterized according to the domain for which you are using so MLlib is actually the it is actually the collection of so many algorithms well on the sidelines I am I know that we are running short on time but I'm tempted to tell you that many of you would have heard about Mahout right so exactly as I think Nabanita, Sunil uh, and uh, you know there are so many people uh, I think Mariam and others are also asking that what exactly are the different alternatives and thankfully you have just uh, you know uh, I think we we are all thinking in the same direction. So, not sure how many of you have heard about something called Mahout. Okay, so Mahout is something which is a machine learning library built on the top of MapReduce. Okay, well, this is something uh, you can Google it out also. Now, why are we talking about MLlib? What is so spe special in MLlib? which is not there in Mahout, there is absolutely nothing special. I repeat, there is absolutely nothing special in MLlib which is not there in Mahout. Now, why are we talking about it then? Because guys, Mahout, in order to run, it needs MapReduce, which of course cannot do in-memory processing. And MLlib, in turn, internally uses Spark Core Engine okay so that's a big difference because here you're talking about in-memory processing that is point one okay and that's a I mean there are various other libraries as well there is something called Veka there are several others I'm not going in those direction because they have a different maturity level some of the specific use cases some of them are not yet you know so evolved and all so that's that's one part right I hope guys those those people who have asked the question you got the answer right now there is another point those people who are aware of Mahout right those people who are aware of Mahout uh, if you follow if you are following the updates there have not been any recent release of Mahout you know the reason because MLlib is in the active development the overall plan is to move these machine learning algorithms as fast as possible on the MLlib and eventually make it production ready and have its proper release right so right now that pre alpha release and all the disclaimer here is some of the signatures may change in future some of the parameters the way they are invoked may change in future but nevertheless they are there right and being developed right Nabinita? others right so there is another interesting question does Mahout integrate with Spark the answer plain answer is no because if it is then probably we should not even be talking about MLlib as of now right so that is that is on the MLlib side and hence guys that's where I would like to take you back okay I would like you to take uh, I would like to take you back to the same slide where we started we just completed the circuit so now this gives you the complete picture right from your different data sources 
you definitely need a good healthy staging area wherein on which you can rely right Hadoop is the best candidate there uh, you can re replace Hadoop probably but only in that case you have you are at your own risk right you are at your own risk altogether typically we use Hadoop or HDFS to you know specifically to just store the data or if you have already existing infrastructure probably you might even like to run your spark jobs as yarn jobs altogether well there are some plus positives and negatives about that but more on that sometime later right so and then comes spark and mlf combination wherein mlf machine learning libraries are invoked on the data which use spark as the underlying engine and then you have the front end applications which will be which will typically be the web applications written by you know developers and which will probably be making some ajax calls or whatever calls they want to to the back end to fetch the data right and that's where you typically see the you know almost real time recommendations being generated for you right guys i hope this gives you a bigger picture a better picture right this was about the recommendation engine or maximum I have to say about theory. So are we done? Of course not. Of course not. We still have almost 20 minutes I think. And with that, I would like to leave this PPT. I would like to spend some time on my... Okay guys, as you know that we typically like to back up all of our things on with with a form of examples right so for that let me just quickly open up the you know spark shell so this is how you typically fire your spark shell again there are quite a lot of you know short circuiting which i have done okay uh, that is the assumption that you already know where exactly Hadoop is installed and you know uh, you are just invoking the spark shell uh, there so yeah at the same time by the time my spark comes up right one thing which I would like to tell the entire class that if you want to know more details about the course about the its offerings what exactly we have as of now you can visit the website edureka.co apaches spark scholar training there you'll get the details about upcoming batches you can get the details about curriculum and other stuff right so you can just visit there if if the contents excite you if the um, i mean um, if the approach excites you there right and at the same time we have provided the numbers there in case if you have further queries which are probably not answered here right um this is this is where you can just you know get the more information from the sales side of it okay that was it i had to say from the sales side because ultimately this webinar is about knowledge sharing right so coming back guys coming back here right now this is where you have okay so when i invoked my spark my scala shell came up. Scala is a programming language and by the way those people who might be interested uh, right now the way our course is structured is we spend of course we understand that not many people would be aware of Scala and as I can see Ravi and even Don Michelle also has asked this question that do I need to be a Java professional for it do I need to be a Scala professional for it and there is somebody who is saying uh, I'm from PHP background well guys we understand that you are all having different experiences different levels of experiences coming from different backgrounds but Spark works best with Scala. It's written in Scala, first thing. Second, uh, uh, you know, just like in Hadoop, right? What is what is your natural choice for MapReduce? Natural choice is Java, right? Because eventually you get the easier integration and you avoid quite a lot of headaches in terms of integration, in terms of performance as well. The same argument the same argument uh, 
you know goes when you talk about Scala. That is the first and foremost argument. Another part, right? Scala in the terms of performance stack, it sits very much near or almost it has almost same kind of performance when it comes to Java. Eventually it converts its code into the byte code and when it comes to the and of course Python is like way different on the different quadrant itself right. So I don't even have the numbers with me but and I think as some people are helping me with it okay. So here is Palni who says Scala is 10 times faster than Python. Thanks. Thanks for the statistics Palani. By the way, uh, I know Palani already. Uh, we have interacted in some of the earlier classes. Thanks Palani for helping me. Okay, now coming back quickly. Uh, so let's just get started and again guys, I don't intend to you know explain you the syntax. That's not the idea. You know, you should just be trying to understand the overall flow altogether. What exactly are we trying to achieve, right? Because at this point of time, having the expectation that you understand the code, you understand the call, you understand the, uh, you know, all of the, uh, let's say, import statements and all, of course, it would be unjust, right? But let's share the excitement of, uh, you know, quickly seeing something up and running. Right, and it would be all command line based by the way right now. So guys, the first thing first, right, uh, I would just go and I will go, I will say, this is one of the publicly available data sets, okay. One of the publicly avail available data sets which I am using. Uh, well, there are some guys who are asking the questions in the terms of is high use as one of the data sources you can use but typically Akriti to come to your question typically uh, you would like to use something called sparks is everybody clear now yeah so Akriti I was just coming to the part wherein I just mentioned that uh, you know you can use but eventually you would prefer to use it along with spark SQL rather than with MLlib that's very rare or probably not even required hope you got the answer. Just going forward guys, just going forward with it. So guys, uh, there is a file and I am just showing you the first few lines altogether. Okay, just showing you first few lines and it's like if you hive meta store in <laughs> logs, yeah, yeah. My, I keep doing quite a lot of things in my machine guys. So it's something like you have a user data which is available and what do we do there is we say that what exactly is the user, what exactly is the movie number and what is the kind of rating on the scale of 1 to 5 which people have given. Okay, So this is something and then this is some sort of record ID which we are ignoring as of now. Okay, So this is something which is kind of let's say base data. It's a public avail publicly available data from movie lens okay movielens.org it's an open source uh, you know this 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 data is publicly open you can use it by the way guys may i just request one thing since i'm showing the hands on part we will be stretching this webinar by 5 or 10 more minutes i hope that should be fine because my intention here was not to rush through the time my intention was to answer your questions also is that fine with you i hope i'll get that much support from all of you Right? Sure. Thanks. That really helps. That really helps. Okay. Now guys, I will, I just wanted to show you the data also. And now I'm going back. I'm going back and then I'll just go here. I'll just start few things. Basically, in the intention purpose, I just created an RDD by loading this data in memory. By the way, this, are you seeing the number here? 100K. So we are talking about 100,000 records. Okay, there are 100,000 records there in this data set. So just wanted to tell like it's a single machine wherein I'm running the code and the data is 100,000 records. Okay, which is, I hope everybody can understand that 
it's quite big right so now i'm kind of doing a bit of processing wherein i'm just creating some of the ratings all together and then i have kind of let's say uh, just just created the data of raw ratings then before doing anything these are some of the imports which i have to do and again they are the development time libraries guys they are not yet production ready library okay als which stands for uh, alternating least square i was talking about this algorithm right this is available as an direct import library and then the rating rating is another library which is already available we have just used it as it is okay going back there now i am kind of let's say so this was my raw rating wherein i just extracted it eventually eventually now this is the place where i am going to feed this rating data to the rating class and now i am trying to get the rating object okay just just telling you what is happening behind the scenes now let us see you know this is somewhere i am causing now some sort of execution will happen some map reduce processing ran and you saw that now that you have the data whatever it was it is now available in the form of a rating object okay which says primarily says the user number 196 has recommended the movie number 242 as 3.0 okay right now these are just the numbers just you know uh, bear with me for few more minutes okay because i will eventually be converting them actually to the movie recommendations okay now uh, there is a bit of training of the data which is required okay so typically i mean i'm not going in the direction of you know machine learning its concepts right now typically you have a training phase altogether wherein the ratings whatever i created right i'm just phasing them i'm just passing three parameters to it the rank the iteration and the lambda basically these are the three different parameters which are required for least square method to perform okay importance of that basically typically it would be you need so right now there are 10 iterations of the program which are which are running well those people who have not realized what happened um, like time is too short to explain on those sides but just to tell you just to give you the idea this program took these two 50 and 0.01 as the parameters of you know the uh, they are like tolerance parameters and other stuff it took it and ran the program 10 times ran the program 10 times by iterating the 100000 records okay every iteration it went through 100000 records it did it 10 times right so we are talking about thousand thousand records by the way and how much time did it take how much time did it take so again i'm not of course asking you to tell me the seconds you got the sense of it right so this is something wherein i just wanted to bring them some of the things now comes the testing phase of the model wherein we typically say okay uh, now that i have the model available with me can i predict that for the user number 789 for the movie number 123 what would be the rating and the predicted rating comes to be 2.5767 and something so i'm not really going and physically checking that now that is the advantage which i'm taking of this short time available what i'm now going to do is Uh, at this point of time the disclaimer is that yes your predicted ratings are correct in, if you go back to the data you try to verify it will show you there okay that is something which i have verified from my side what i'm going to do is in the interest of time i am now using this model so that's where you will so this is like typically guys right now you are whatever you are seeing is a super short circuited path i would say wherein i did a very quick uh, training and then did a very quick validation and then now i'm on the side of recommendation product guys let me tell the previous two step the previous two step of training validation training validation 
they are the guys who take 90% of your development time till the time because that those kind of parameters which you saw right 50 10 0 0 0.01 etc they take huge amount of time to arrive at a certain number and the only way is hit and trial for some cases there are some accepted numbers for some cases there are not and in some cases they are even supposed to be designed or decided at runtime for which you have another set of statistical models okay so hence idea is to tell you that there are like it's complicated <laughs> right from the machine learning perspective right right now since the focus is on how exactly spark does right so these are the recommendations which are kind of generated for this user okay still it doesn't make sense as of now right now guys this is the place where I generated the recommendations looks like okay but now comes the time when I attach it to the data set of movies so at the same place where I had the user data I have the data of movies also and now is the place where I load the movies and I reflect back or I throw back this data to the movies data set that's what I'm going to do now okay so basically I'm first creating the titles all together okay and then basically collecting them as map eventually if you look at it this is where I'm just creating the numbers I hope everybody remembers that I had the user ID I had the movie ID and then I had the rating do you guys remember right that's how your ratings objects were created right that's how your rating objects were created see this user ID this and eventually the rating which you created right right and here what I'm doing is I'm just creating let's say a mapping all together right this ID belongs means such as a movie number or this number belongs to a particular movie name altogether right that's what I just did go back and time to connect the dots okay so I'm not going into the syntax but I hope it should not be a ro rocket science what I'm doing is I'm saying movies for the user eventually the ratings data set I created I'm searching it for the key you know all the keys which I generated for the user and I'm looking for the user ID 789 okay so I'm kind of hard coding it eventually I'm seeing that these are the recommendations which got generated okay how many recommendations are generated actually how many recommendations did I generate for this user I generated 33 recommendations okay can we see the recommendations please yes why not so I'm showing you top 10 are you seeing this take 10 take 10 it's like limit limit in terms of SQL okay so I'm limiting these recommendations and I'm saying show me only top 10 recommendations you get the recommendations for this user based on the rating which this guy provided right eventually these are the different recommendations this is a very short circuited path eventually when we will be integrating it with our course material okay of spark we will actually be creating it kind of a entire project wherein we will first be giving the details about you know like the philosophy behind it the the ideas behind it and then the code and probably it, uh, not probably of course it would be in the form of a project altogether right but guys I just wanted to you know quickly give you the idea in few minutes time itself that what exactly does it take to create a quick recommender well just to underline you just process hundred thousand records in seconds and then for a you created a model of course it was super easy because code was already written and I was copy pasting and running it right but 
yes, uh, this particular, sorry, this particular part is kind of, you know, where the crux of the matter goes. Even if, you know, the crux of the matter is about the part, code part, the idea here is that whatever you did, let me just show you back, okay? Whatever you did here, right? Uh, where does it, where does it uh, go? ALS dot train and ALS dot predict, etc. Whatever you just did is kind of just a call. It's just a call to MLLab library and nothing else. Everything else is a pure Spark code. It doesn't matter at all, right, guys? So I hope. So Palini, I think you were asking a question. I accidentally gave the answer at this point of time itself, right? So eventually, that's where the power comes. One, you don't care about the implementation of this kind of algorithm, right? The first thing. Second, the speed. With that, guys, I hope you got a good idea about how exactly the things work. Right, guys? I hope, so with that, if I go back to the uh, PPT, well, that's where I would like to conclude my presentation. And I hope I was anyway trying my level best to answer. You, If you really want to see some more references, these are some of the references which they provided. They will be all available. Again, I repeat at the end of it, that they're all going to be available on your, uh, you know, mail IDs, so you can refer them. And guys, if that excites you enough, do you, if you care to visit this website, edurica.co, eventually Apache Spark Scala training, and there you'll get all of the information. So if it excites you, let's see you sometime in class. That's all. Hope guys, you had a good time. You got something as a takeaway. With that, logging off, thank you. And do provide your feedback. Looking forward for that. Bye. Bye as of now. Thank you, guys.